the Dion applause. That's right. <laughs> um, you two might not superficially appear to have that much in common. Whitney, you're 29. You're the creator of the social app Bumble. Um, which started in dating, but now obviously extends to social and professional networking. Um, it's got, by the way, 42 million users. Who here uses Bumble? Who here is on Bumble? OK. It's hard All right. to see out there. Okay. I, see so, I see some All right. hands. There's a couple hands yeah. out there. Everybody else needs to download it. <laughs> um, Dion, you're the iconic designer and philanthropist and a woman who is in now the self-described third act of her professional career, which we're going to hear about. Um, but you guys actually have a lot in common, and you both described each other when we were backstage as your spirit animals. You two are spirit animals. That is I right. Um, so I We had a nice lunch. We had lunch, and we, we, we did relate to each yeah, other. Yeah, very much so. Well, you're, I wanted you're, to you're everybody's hero. You're mine. Well, I don't know. That's true. And but that is actually something that you both have in common, because Whitney, you've also become a hero to a whole generation of That's young, right. not just female, but many of them female entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs. Um, and I want to talk to you, first of all, about something that I think is, in fact, the title of this session, if I'm not mistaken, Pioneers with Purpose. You're both women who say that you very intentionally run your companies in a purpose-driven way. So, Dion, starting with you, um, when did you start to think about your work and your company that way? Was it well, from the beginning? You know, first or of all, really? when you start, you start because you need to find your identity. I want, I'm, for me, it was my seek for independence. I wanted to be independent. I wanted to be able to have a, a, a man's life in a woman's body. And so, <laughs> therefore, for me, to be independent was my goal. And I was very lucky. I became independent very quickly. I was very successful. And very quickly, I became, um, I was in the light, uh, you know, I mean, uh, um, I had a voice. And it was also a very interesting time. It was the early 70s. It was Gloria Steinem, liberation of women, you know, women liberation. We were very free. Uh, sex was very free, we didn't have AIDS, I mean, it was a very nice time to be young. <laughs> and, uh, and as I was becoming confident myself, to, because I was becoming confident through a dress, I, and I went around selling my dress, in a way, the more confident I was, the more confidence I was selling. So I wasn't thinking that I had a purpose. I was barely thinking I was a designer. I was just a woman, a young woman, you know, early 20s, who was doing her thing and who was successful. And I, and, and I was sharing it, you know, and I, I, I spoke out because one of the reasons why I became uh, outspoken is because I realized that if I wasn't out outspoken, I was being interviewed by journalists, and they had this preconceived idea about me as being as a Park Avenue princess. Mm -hmm. And so I said, no, no, no. And so I was some, very often being a little provocative, mm -hmm. but at least when they quoted me, they quoted me for what I said. Right. I've heard you talk about a cover of New York Magazine that I think was in the 70s, which was about you and your then husband. And you, I think, said on NPR that looking at that cover and kind of reacting negatively to it really inspired you to pursue your own independence. All right, so we have to give this story now. Uh, <laughs> it was 1973, and I, uh, it was a beautiful, glamorous photo cover of this very glamorous couple. And it said, uh, the couple that has everything, is everything enough? Mm. And then, uh, so it, it, it was, uh, it changed my life. It certainly destroyed my marriage. But the, what it really did is that it made me realize that I couldn't stand, I couldn't actually stand for the couple. I could only stand for what I said. And therefore, even though Aegon stayed my best friend and forever was the father of my children, I could not be a couple anymore. Mm -hmm. um, 
just following up on another thing that you, you were saying, you, you talked about not seeing yourself as a designer at first. When did, when did that kick in for you? You really want to know? Yeah. 40 years later. Really? It's, uh, well, because I always thought I was a woman, I mean, a girl first and then a woman, who made clothes for other women and I did things for other women, but I didn't go to, um, to I didn't study design. I did, so I was always a little bit shy in a sense of, of calling myself, even though I, you know, I had awards and things like that. It's only, and also the one thing is that, you know, whenever you see my name, Diane von Furstenberg, Rob Dress. Yeah, and for years and years I say, why, why? I've done so many other things. Why only the wrap dress? And in 2004, <laughs> and wrap jumpsuit. So in 2014, when I celebrated the 40th anniversary of the wrap dress, and I had this big exhibition at LACMA, mm -hmm. and, and I arrived that morning, went driving my car, and I saw the big building, and I saw the big thing, and I thought, you know what? I accepted. Oh. I, I accepted. <laughs> and that's the wow. day that, and I, that's actually the last page of my book. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Um, Whitney, let's talk about the purpose of your company when you, when you started it. You talk a lot about being purpose driven. What do you feel is the North Star of Bumble? So when I started Bumble, I didn't wake up and say, oh, let's go start another dating app because we need more of those. Another, uh, just rewinding for those who yeah, might not know you had been at Tinder. Right, so I, I had um, been a co-founder of Tinder. Um, I really felt that the internet was destructive for young women. Mm -hmm. And myself included, I was being um, bombarded by very bad behavior online. And I was taking these, these comments to heart. Here I am, you know, with my now husband, lovely boyfriend who's sweet to me and kind to me, but I'm letting random strangers tell me awful things about me. And I started thinking, if I'm such a fortunate person with love surrounding me, what does the 13-year-old feel like mm, who's right. going through this in junior high? And maybe she has a destructive family home life. You know, this could ruin lives. And that was when I started thinking, how can I rework this? How can I rewrite the internet? from a female point of view, in a way that would empower women, encourage them, give them confidence. A lot of what you're speaking about, the confidence is so important, and mine had been completely erased. So I really thought, if we can rewrite how we treat one another digitally, um, perhaps we can make a step in the right direction and, and hope, er you know, hope to eradicate misogyny one day. No big deal, just yeah. a small little thought. Um, <laughs> Millennia, <yeah>. gone. <laughs> okay, gone. Um, and so that was really the beginning of it and everything we've done there, you know, thereafter has been purpose driven. Um, we've made a lot of big decisions that could have been, you know, big marketing opportunities, for mm -hmm. example, that didn't fit our mission. Um, and it's been our northern star. It helps us take left or right on any given day. Mm -hmm. Uh, you did something very courageous earlier this year when after the Parkland shootings, you decided to not allow images with guns in them on Bumble. And that might not sound in this particular zip code like such a risky thing to do, but there was a lot of pushback. And I know you had to have a security detail after well, that. Well, we live in Texas, mm -hmm. so that's um, where we're headquartered. And it's a polarizing topic, very polarizing. I mean, I went to my doctor's office the other day and there's a no gun lo logo on the door. And I'm thinking, how have we gotten here? Like, mm -hmm. this, they have to let you know not to bring your gun to your doctor's office. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, beyond all of that, if you think about what we're trying to do at Bumble, we want to empower connections. We want to make them kinder. No more abusive relationships. Probably every person in this yeah. audience has had an emotionally abusive relationship with a friend, with a lover, with a boss, with somebody. Mm -hmm. And we have to reverse engineer that. And if you look at domestic abuse, primarily, and violence, um, you know, in a lot of these unhealthy relationships, if, there's a, if there is violence involved, guns are part of that equation. Guns don't fit our mission, and I've said this before, but if you line up our values, empowerment, kindness, accountability, guns, mm -hmm. that doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And so we, we banned them from the platform, and um, you know, that's the decision we made, and we'll always do the right thing for, for what we believe is you know, in line with our values. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with how personally scary some of that must have been for you? I mean, you'd obviously been trolled a lot online before, but this was different, people sending you actual pictures of their guns with mm -hmm. threats. Yeah, no, the most interesting ones were 
um, some emails I got from men with a photo of their you know what and then their Glock and they said I'm gonna give you my this and my Glock and I was like oh my god this is insane but um, you know it's poetry very poetic <laughs> um, you know listen this is this is this is life if mm -hmm. you stand up for anything the courageous women that take to the streets during marches everyone is at risk of mm -hmm. hatred right look what's going on in New York City today so you just have to know that as long as you're doing the right thing, you you know make sure you're safe to the best of your ability, and mm -hmm. you just proceed, carry right. on. Um, I want to ask both of you how you translate the mission of your company into the actual daily life of the company and your employees. There's that famous business saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast, meaning you can have the best possible strategy in the world, but if you can't figure out how to actually get your company culture to reflect that and get everybody to be as in love with that shared mission as you are, then, it, it, then it's all for naught. Um, Dion, starting with you, how do you, is that something that you think about? How do you well, work on that? What, you know, when people ask, what, what, what is a DBF woman, right? What, what is it that I try to give women, you mm -hmm. know, by, is really for them to feel in charge, mm -hmm. you know? It's about being in charge. Doesn't, I mean, you, you, if you feel in charge, you don't have to show it in an aggressive way, but you know that you are. And, um, and as a company, therefore, we give the tools to, for a woman to, to, to be in charge and to be the woman she wants to be. And it's really, you know, at the end, everything is about the relationship you have with yourself. Even if you're looking for a relationship outside, the truth is that once you have the relationship with yourself, then any relationship is a plus and not a must. Mm -hmm. And I what we don't want to be... <laughs> I love that. You know, I mean, there is nothing that's less attractive right than being needy. Mm -hmm. Even if your man loves you to death, he will like you less if you're needy. Or if he doesn't, then there's something wrong with him. I mean, so I think that, that being in charge is, is what, you know. Listen, I was an icon, right? Now, in my third act, mm -hmm. I am the oracle, right? Because I'm an old woman mm. and because I have a lot of experience. There's nothing that I haven't done, so come to me for advice. Yeah. And, that's my number one advice. I You're still that. an icon, <laughs> forever an icon. Um, and I, I want to come back to that and uh, your role as an oracle in a, in a minute. But um, let's talk. <laughs> I, I forget I'd the like, question now. I'd like, to, so I'd like to spend an hour and a half talking just about that. Um, but Whitney, talk a little bit about how you create culture at Bumble and what have been some of the learning lessons along the way about how to do that right. So you said that a lot of people feel that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. I think that mission eats culture for bre breakfast because you can't just show up and paint the walls a color and say, okay, here's our values, let's frame them on the wall, now go, mm. do it. Mm -hmm. You have to have a purpose, you have to have a mission. And when everybody comes to work in the morning with the same purpose, then the culture is formed naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's very authentic and it's something you can't, you know, bring in some outside expert and say, can you help me with our culture? No, where's your mission? Find your purpose mm -hmm. and the that's culture right. will form around it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's what sets, you know, good companies apart from great companies. Mm -hmm. Because great companies don't just operate, they, they create change mm -hmm. and they embark on some crazy journey to really make the world a better place. Yeah, mission each culture for breakfast. That's that's good. That company should print that. Um, Not as good as the Oracle comment. That yeah, that was good. That's gonna that has to be on well, the DBF T-shirt. I've had a few years ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we're all gonna strive to catch up. Um, you know, Dion, building on what you were saying before about being in charge. You know, we hear and talk a lot about the challenges of being a woman in a position of power, but I want to talk a little bit about the opportunities because I think if you look at this current generation of men who are being accused of bad behavior, whether in the workplace or not, from a you know Brett Kavanaugh to Harvey Weinstein to Les Moonves, very few of them grew up having female bosses. 
And I'm curious about the impact that it will have on a younger generation of men who grow up working for women like you and the women who emulate you and who can learn what female leadership looks like. It, you know, Whitney, you have a lot of men in your company. You know, Dion, you, I know there are a lot of women on your team, but you have men as well. What do you think they, they learn and what will this next generation learn? Oh my God, you know, I don't know. I, I'm very fluid. <laughs> you know, I mean, my, I mean and, and one of the things that you have to, I mean, I have spent my life to empower women, right? Mm -hmm. My life, I've, I mean, I'm involved and I speak. But now I'm beginning to say, you know what? I sh we should also have to worry about the little boys mm -hmm. because we have to prepare the little boys in a way because otherwise, I mean, excuse my word, but no man is gonna have a hard on again, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Is that really a risk? I love her. <laughs> that's, I know that's going to be quoted. I'm going to be there. This is, a, this is the, next, the next magazine cover. <laughs> this is the next title. But the point is that but if a woman <laughs> says it, maybe it's easier. You know what I mean? It's just like it's abuse of power that is not good, whether it comes from a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about the power. Mm -hmm. It's about... You know, you shouldn't abuse your power. You have, we have to be human beings. We have to respect the others, pay attention to the others, give time to their vulnerability, and then you do your job. If you are a leader, you lead. Mm. If you, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, it's got to be a little bit smooth. But what I do know is that women should not be you should be treated as meat. Mm -hmm. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and you know, true. and and when you have a boss that feels that every time he goes by, he thinks that if he touches you, you gonna you it, it, you should take it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. no, no way. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, no way. And and I think what I <laughs> agreed. Um, and, and I think, you know, what I'm curious about is what the impact of having a, you know, generation of men who grow up knowing female bosses alongside male ones, what the impact of that will be. And, and Whitney, I'm, you know, I'm curious what you think, what lessons you hope the men on your team take away from you as a woman in leadership. So it's been very interesting, mm -hmm. um, you know, having men in the room with a lot of the conversations we're having where we're going to take out an ad that says, believe women, yeah. right? And the, it's, this is an ad that would say we what? took out an ad um, after Dr. Ford right. tes testified right. that said believe women in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Also very interesting, I got a lot more hate mail from the Wall Street Journal readers than the New York Times. Just interesting feedback. <laughs> um, anyway, I think that when we show men, and again, to your point, this is not man versus woman, right? Mm -hmm. This no. is about humanity and how we treat one another. When we show men that having a woman be empowered, allowing her to be confident, be in charge, it doesn't threaten them. Mm -hmm. It makes their life better. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what we're doing on Bumble by trying to encourage women to make the first move, we're not trying to make it easier on guys or let them be lazy or whatever some of the feedback has been. We're really trying to show, look what happens when you let a woman lead when you let a woman have confidence, be empowered, and not be perceived as meat, something waiting on the sidelines for you to go pick off a shelf. Mm -hmm. That's not what this is about, but to your question, I think the first boss a, a, a boy ever has is their mother. Mm -hmm. And if their mother is disempowered, if mm -hmm. their mother it has That's no right. confidence, if their mother is feeling that she's meat in mm -hmm. her life, wherever that might be, this is going to have a negative impact on that little boy. He'll grow into a man that thinks like that. So I think what we need to do is empower women starting early to be confident, to be secure, to know their worth, and let everybody learn how to respect one another. This is about human kindness and human respect. It's not really the battle of the genders. Mm -hmm. It's about reverse engineering these archaic norms. Mm -hmm. How much do you see that changing right now? I mean, 
you know, obviously there's been a lot of talk over the last, not, not just since Me Too, but prior to that, particularly in Silicon Valley, about how to improve the position for women. One of my favorite Silicon Valley, was not quite a study, but examples was the two women who were starting an art and technology company and couldn't get people to return their emails, so they invented a fake mail mm -hmm co-founder whose name I believe was Kevin and oh people God. loved to return Kevin's emails and were always asking how they could better help Kevin and um, have we are we past that no no we're not we're no. not past that and even with women by the way mm -hmm. sometimes it's women also mm -hmm. absolutely you know and it's not true. Just, and 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 this is this is this is ridiculous I mean this is this is absolutely ridiculous and uh, but women have to you know, have to, we still have a lot of, we don't have enough women in these big jobs. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough women in the boards. We don't have enough women. I mean, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. I thought when I was young, I was a feminist and it was, and then, and then my, my daughter's generation, they just took it for granted and then they went back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now this generation, my granddaughters, they're very much feminists. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. there is no, Gen Z. No. Mm -hmm. They are, I mean, they know that they are equal and they, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, and you also feel we're, we're not past that. No, and what terrifies me is I've heard a lot of men say, oh, you know, I won't be in a room alone with a woman yes. anymore. I'm going to be accused. And I said, yes. if you're a predator, you should I be mean, worried. I yeah. know. But, <laughs> I mean, is your fly zipped? <laughs> like, come on. I yeah. said that a friend of mine who is a um, who is an executive told me, you know, I won't take a meeting alone with a woman. And I said, you cannot say that because if you say that, then you should not have a, a, a meeting with alone anybody. with a man either. Mm -hmm. And 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 he, he thought about it. He said, you're right. I shouldn't say that. But we're so used to. I mean, you know, it's it's so ingrained how people think, but. We can't, we have to, we can't think that way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to stay on the subject of women in power for a second. Um, in New York Magazine's issue this week about women in power, there's a great interview with the veteran journalist Andrea Mitchell. And she talks about how even today, and she's, I believe, in her 70s, she will still come out of a news conference and ask herself, was I too pushy in there? that there is still that, that desire to be liked, which certainly as a journalist, you have to overcome frequently in order to be able to do your job. Um, do you guys experience that, and what do you do when you do? Um, like four seconds ago? Like, I do that all the time, and mm -hmm. that's a problem. It's... No, you are not like that. A little bit. <laughs> I really am, I promise. I asked... 300 times this morning, those questions. It's crazy. Which question? But not when I'm wearing the jumpsuit. I feel very empowered in the jumpsuit. No, I'm very you are, in the you jumpsuit. are very, you, you know. But listen, you know, but people are insecure. I mean, whether they're men or women. Yeah, no, you insecurity know. is it's, it's a human uh, thing. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, here's a nice little thing to remember. When you doubt your power, you give power to your doubt. I love that. Make that t-shirt too. Yeah, can we get that in a... Sure, I love that. No, that's very true. No, but to that point, you know, and I actually was part of that series um, mm -hmm. that they yeah. just did, and, and I said to them, I said, you know, I finally now let go of this trying to be nice to everybody, please mm -hmm. everybody. And I think there's been this um, insecurity that I've had the last few years is like, I have to overcompensate, be overly nice to get the respect or to get, you know, get my point across. And that's not being kind, that's being phony. Mm -hmm. And so I that's think there's right. this huge difference between being nice and being kind. That's right. And being kind is exactly. actually sometimes not so nice, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a very fine line, but it's a very important line. And I'm being mindful about trying to be kinder and less nice. That's interesting. So being kind is doing the right thing. Correct. Being nice is adhering to what society Anybody might well, expect. Well, nice is like. more passive. Very mm -hmm. passive. Kind is more active. In charge. Mm -hmm. More in charge. You know, I mean, you're kind. Yes, it's you, more in charge. You, 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 you make an effort, you, you know, you pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Dion, you were talking about um, your new life as an oracle. <laughs> There'll be a long line of people waiting to ask you questions as you, as you leave the theater. Um, I want to ask about the importance, as we talk about women getting into equal, equal footing with men in the business world, 
how we have to assess our ideas and ridiculous stereotypes about women and aging. You know, oh, there are at last that's count. That's a big, big subject. Yeah. I love that subject. <laughs> All right, aging. I don't understand why people are embarrassed about saying their age. To this day, I cannot understand that. If you are 71, which is what I am, that means, that means that I've made it to 71. <laughs> I mean, you should congratulate me. Yeah, I, should, I congratulate I myself that I made it. <laughs> I mean, aging, age, the fact that aging means you have lived. Mm -hmm. And I've lived really fully. I should be 140, <laughs> you know? I mean, so it's aging is, and I know, I know people look at me and she say, why doesn't she do it? Why hasn't she done anything to her face? And uh, maybe because I don't see myself, I don't know. But, but, and I have lots of beautiful pictures when I was young and I post those. And, uh, but, so take a lot of pictures now because I promise you, if you don't like them now, you will love them in 10 years. That's like that great Nora Ephron line. If you're if anybody out there listening who is under the age of 35, please go put on a bikini now and don't take it off for 15 years. <laughs> so, um, so aging is is I don't know why, but people are afraid to say their age when they're in their 30s. Embrace it, embrace it, own it. Own it is one of the big lessons. Own it. Own your imperfections; they become beautiful. Yeah. Own your insecurities, they become your strength. Own your fear, it becomes your courage. Mm -hmm. Own it. Mm -hmm. You're amazing. And, and own it also in the way that a man would. I mean, at last count, there were at least three men over the age of 72 seriously considering getting into the presidential I know, it's race. ridiculous. You know, where Can you run? Huh? Can you run for president, please? Oh, no, 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 no. No, I'm too old. I, I, I mean, there is. The mayor, too. I think what is very important is certain things for every age, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you get to be older, when you get to be at the autumn of your life, then you share your experience. Then you could be more compassionate and share your experience. That's valuable. Mm -hmm. That you can't, a young person can't compete with you doing that because yeah. they haven't got the experience. Right. Well, I want to salute you also for always in interviews sharing your age, which I know as a former magazine editor, many women, even those in incredible positions of power, do not. And but I think anyway, it's very otherwise, would you know what? They go on their phone and they Google it. So yeah. they it. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, Dion, just staying with you for one second. Um, you, you said recently that you didn't think you were a good manager. Um, I think you're probably under, underestimating your own management no, techniques. No, I'm not a good manager. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a terrible enabler. I am too. Oh, it's the worst. What does that mean? I think women have a tendency to do that. What, what is that exactly? Well, especially women founder who invented themselves and made their dream come true, they think that everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And not everybody can do that. Meaning that you enable Well, so people. I think that I can turn any Volkswagen into a Rolls Royce and it doesn't happen. <laughs> You That's know, the female tendency to want to fix things, right? Yeah, it's like, you know, oh, and you, if you give the opportunity and so on. So it's, um, listen, women have, you know, women are maternal. So they have different ways of, of leading, I guess, you mm -hmm. know? And so, uh, but I'm not very, I'm definitely not a good manager, no. But I'm a good mother, I'm a good at a lot of other things. Well. Parenting is a form of management. Um, the biggest form of management, probably. Yeah. Not there yet. Um, how have you learned to manage? It's not intuitive, necessarily. Oh, goodness. You don't want to ask me. I'm, I, I want to dream all day long. And so if you leave me in the room with anybody in the business, I've turned the PL upside down and the budget backwards, and we're dreaming and we're doing something crazy. Um, so I definitely have incredible team around me that helps stay grounded mm -hmm. and execute and make sure that 
the crazy dreams are actually taking actionable steps to becoming a reality. Um, but you know, I don't think founders are good managers. That's there you the go. Thing. Okay. Because founders is about dream. Mm -hmm. Founders is about making a dream. You know, not thinking. So founders should stay found. I mean, that's it's a very unique kind of thing. And then you have you know CFOs and things around you. <laughs> But you're a founder and a CEO. I am. You know, listen. So is she wrong? <laughs> no, she's not wrong. I think there's um, there's a scale, there's a spectrum, and I think that the more managerial I become, I lose a bit of the creative spirit. Mm -hmm. And so it's in the company's best interest for me to stay um, more inspired and excited and um, focused on the vision where we're going next, what's the next big move. And then I have such amazing people on, on the team and I think my form of leadership is um, very intuitive. I you know, definitely did not go to business school and learn how to do because any of this. Because she's a founder. <laughs> so, you know, there you go. And, 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 that's, that, and that special thing is very unique. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, by the way, nothing is stale, right? So, if nature is not stale, what is a comp why should a company be stale? Mm -hmm. You know, it goes, it moves, it goes up, it goes down, it goes, you know, Absolutely. it's like, it's not like, oh, okay, I found the recipe and it's not gonna change. Right. Yeah, no, that's very true. Right. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about confidence, but that can be challenging for founders because your personal, it, who you are as a person is so bound up with the company. How do you compartmentalize? Like, how do you keep from feeling like you know whether the company had a good day or a bad day is a referendum on you personally. Um, ask my husband. It's crazy. It never turns off. You're very invested in this. It's part of your DNA at a certain point, right? And you know this more than me, but you live it and you breathe it. You don't go to work and then you go home and it's over. I mean, it becomes a part of your aura. It becomes a part of who you are. And so, for me, I've struggled a bit over the years letting go of things. I want to know why the font was a certain size on some random billboard in Germany. And they're like, well, that's, you, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. So That's good. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's um, because she's a founder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Can we do this all day? You need a founder support group, clearly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it um, would be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good reality show. Yeah. If only we knew anyone in television. Uh, um, Whitney, I want to ask you about Bumble expanding in India. Um, first of all, is it accurate that that was partly Priyanka Chopra's idea, or is that an urban myth? No, it's not an urban myth. Um, I would say that India has definitely always been on the radar, mm -hmm. but Priyanka definitely is why we are here right now. Um, I probably would have waited a little bit longer, but she's very persuasive. Has anyone ever seen her in real life? I know. She'll tell you to do anything, and you're like, she's absolutely, a Priyanka. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you just say founder? She's a big founder. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yes. Very persuasive one. <laughs> yes. No, we, and believe me, in India, they need them. Oh, yeah. yes. They need women founders. Well, yes, yes. That, that's actually part of what I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about, because you know, India could be a very dangerous country mm. for women. Rates of violence are very high. It's Human different trafficking. going yeah. into that market. And how do you make sure you're going to be able to protect your users? It certainly is. And it's a big feat. And actually, most companies in our space have not been able to survive in India. And because of this, you know, the trust and the security of women is paramount for this working. And uh, Priyanka and her team have been incredible. We're partners in this. So, you know, she has invested a lot of her personal time and, and um, team into, into making sure we do this right. We have over 5,000 moderators. We're taking security and safety to a whole new level. You have to be a verified user. You have to show that it's really you. Credit card companies take the same measures. So mm -hmm. it's serious. You know, we're really trying to prevent you know, human fraud. We don't want people to hurt one another. And you know, it's going to be trial and error. We're going to just do our best to get in there and, and figure out what more is needed. But we have a full team and staff ready to go. Mm. And what else is on the horizon? Oh, gosh. I'll ask the Oracle. She'll tell you. <laughs> 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 no, there, there's all sorts of exciting things com <clears throat> coming. I think, you know, for us, it's all about building the global empowerment brand. And that's why I admire DVF so much, mm -hmm. because that brand and what you've created inspires women being in charge of their own lives, and that's so aligned with what we're doing at Bumble. Mm. Um, 
there have been rumors that you would entertain an offer from Facebook to buy you. Is that accurate? Would you? I don't think I've ever said that. I don't know where that came from. But um, listen, whatever the best opportunity is for us to expand to every corner of the earth, that will be the exit strategy, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's user first, it's mission first, and whoever the best partner for that is, will, will be. Mm -hmm. um, what are you each curious about, about the other? We know you're spirit animals. Um, what have I not asked that you would like to know about one another? Whitney, I'm going well, first. I mean, okay. I don't want to share it. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Uh, should be interesting. I, I, I said we had lunch and I dis and we discovered she's a wonderful person, and what I what I like so much about Whitney is that she is a young, very successful businesswoman, but she has a private life and she has a beautiful life and uh, and she's a happy person. And so one does not, you know, you can have both. And I love, I love when I found that out about you. Thank you. That's very kind. I can't believe this is real life. Like, how did that just happen? <laughs> she talks about her You're husband. You're amazing. Very sweet. You're incredible. Thank you for saying that. Do you have a, a question that you'd like to ask? I do have a question yeah. for you. OK. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure you've already had dinner with everybody that is interesting in the world, but if there's one person. Alive. Yes, and why? <laughs> alive. And then let's hear not alive. Yeah, and then let's hear not alive. Oh, if not alive, there's plenty, you know. From OK, Leo OK, let's do not alive first. OK, I mean, Leonardo da Vinci, or Marlene Dietrich, or Albert Einstein, there's plenty. But uh, alive, who would I like to meet? Um, and why? And why? Um, I would have liked to meet Mother Teresa, but she's not alive. Um, <laughs> um, oh my God! Uh, uh, let me think about it. I think okay. what we're getting to is that you literally have yeah, met see, that's everyone. <laughs> she's already had dinner with everybody, yeah. or breakfast. What? I said, or you've had breakfast with everyone too. No, no, but I mean, I've met a lot of people for sure. Yeah. And. Um, <laughs> And you know the the yeah I met a lot of people, <laughs> but but the people in power are not all. I mean they're always a little bit of a disappointment. How so? I mean real power, yeah. Uh, but I've met so many incredible people, and you know that's the thing is that it's paying attention to people. You can have, I, I don't like small talk. I hate co uh, cocktail parties where you say hello to somebody and they're already saying hello to 400 people. I hate that, but I love intimacy. That's why I love to have lunch. You can have intimacy with somebody you meet in an elevator, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, but just pay attention to who they are because everyone is interesting. Everyone is a novel. Even the most boring person is a novel. <laughs> you know, it's true. it's true. And that is such an incredible thing to discover. Don't, don't waste time doing or using words that don't mean anything. Pay attention. Your words are energy. Your words are powerful. Pay attention when you meet somebody. Sometimes you, I have a little trick that's very nice, okay. Uh, is that every morning, the first thing I do is I try, I try to, the first two emails I do are things that don't benefit me. Mm. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. And it's a very nice little thing. And it's, if, if you have a voice and if you are a little bit connected, you can actually introduce this person to that person, which they would have never met before. You don't have to leave a message. You don't need to talk. You could just write it properly, and you could transform people's lives. Mm. That's a very nice thing to do. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is the perfect place to leave this. Um, Deanne, Whitney, thank you guys so much. I will see you at the Founders Support thank Group. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. And